these two pro gamers, they keep facing off against each other in the weekly ESO Open Cups. So you know what? They're some of the very best that we have in StarCraft 2. I'm excited for it. Because spotting right here in game number one of today's best of three series, in the top left hand corner, we have none other than Max Pax and his opponent in the opposite corner with the blue zerg drones he goes by the name of Raynor. for the longest time Raynor basically ignored the weekly cups he didn't really play in a whole lot of them kind of like Serral, kind of like maru the top tier pro gamers generally don't seem to play in the eso open cups all too frequently couple reasons as to why that is usually first off well once you've made over a million dollars in tournament earnings i mean rainer's not quite yet there but maybe one day you will be but if you're for example a maru or a Serral, i guess at some point a couple hundred dollars here and there doesn't really do you a whole lot but secondly obviously you have to actually adjust your schedule as well right you have to be able to play at hours that you might not necessarily be super comfortable with and lastly, I mean, obviously, if there are a lot of your replays floating around the internet, or at the very least, if there's a lot of games of you available, it also shows what your tendencies and your strategies currently are. Now, for the longest time, Raynor didn't really play in the ESL Open Cups, but recently at, for example, IAM Karavitsa, in his mind, he certainly did underperform a little bit, so I guess he's gone back to basics. And every once in a while, I think that's a great choice. I don't really know exactly if this means that we're going to be seeing Raynor in every ESL Open Cup for, you know, the next few months. But I I, I don't know. I'm going to enjoy it while the man is playing them, because he is certainly one of the very best pro gamers in the entire game. That being said, even though Max Pax statistically on a League of Legends is considered to be the best Protoss player in the world right now, the problem that Max Pax faces is that his Protoss versus Zerg is his worst matchup. So, I, I can imagine that Max Pax is maybe a little bit frustrated on the one hand that he can't just win this tournament, which he does from time to time, right? I mean, back in the early days of the ESL Weekly, it used to be Hero Marine that won the majority of them, then Clem obviously has won a ton as well. But lately, Max Pax has certainly not had a bad performance. Lately, as in like the last half year to maybe the, uh, the last year or so, but now that Raynor is playing in this cup as well, I can imagine that on the one hand, Max Pax is happy with the practice, but on the other hand, he's gotta be a little bit frustrated about the whole situation. Now, I think this also should give us a pretty cool understanding, though, of... Ooh, okay, he does get one of the Adepts. This should give us a pretty cool understanding as well of where Max Pax is currently at in this particular matchup. Great control right there by Raynor. Not losing anything here. Well, a bunch of Zerklings, but no drones, and I think that's a trade he will be more than happy to make any day of the week. Okay, he starts up a Spore Crawler over at the third base as well. So far, Max Pax is getting cut off in every corner of the game. He does have a third Nexus, however, and that is always nice. Now, in my mind, I, I can imagine that Raynor is probably one of the worst opponents for Max Pax right now. Because Raynor is very strong when it comes to playing the macro game, but he can also be quite cheesy, especially in the mid game. He's got, yeah, I think, a lot bigger of a variety. Not that Serral is incapable of playing, you know, those those aggressive mid game pushes, but in my mind, at the very least, I don't really see Serral going for like a Nidus Swarm Host opener or something along those lines. Whereas Raynor is perfectly capable of something along those lines. Now, obviously, another player that Max Pax does play against quite a bit would be Dark. Dark is capable of anything. He does get four drones here, that's not bad. But Dark plays relatively sloppy, if you compare it at the very least to, for example, a Raynor or, for example, a Serral. Generally speaking, Dark, yeah, he's a bit of a madman. The ESL Open Cups are also not really a good indicator of what Dark is really capable of, because as soon as the really big tournaments roll around, suddenly Dark plays an entirely different playstyle. Now, I really do like this aggression right here from Maxipex. Yeah, six drones. Now suddenly these Adepts show up as well, even if he cancels the Shade. There we go, he's still forcing out Zerklings. This is not bad at all, considering he hasn't lost any of the Oracles here. The first two of these adepts weren't all too successful, but at this point, I think it's all, yeah, it's all fine. Uh, they really want to get some more damage in, though. Yeah, considering how locked up and tight Raynor has been so far, I think six drones is really the best you can hope for. It's going to be Blink together with the plus one ground weapons here on the back of this for Max Pax. Ooh. And that is a very quick fleet beacon and a very quick second Stargate. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. I think Max Pax basically, in his mind, right? So he's very much so a grinder. In his mind, he needs to 
changed his matchup somehow. In his mind, he needs to figure out a strategy that works consistently over the course of multiple games. So, apparently what we're doing in this match is drastically... Yeah, produce the second Stargate and the Fleet Beacon earlier. I don't know if it's a great plan. Hydra then, by the way, right here for Raynor, who decided to cut some corners. Yeah, he's decided to skip that Roach Warren in this match. That is something that Zerg players like to do when they know their opponents very well. Protoss doesn't really have the luxury to cut corners as much, because Zerg can very quickly switch to, well, massive unit production. But there we go. This is a carrier rush. Interesting. I don't know if it's good. But it's interesting. <laughs> At the very least, it gives us a... Yeah, a look into the mind of Max Pex right now. Because apparently he believes that this is the way to do it. Adepts are being sacrificed at this point. Not really getting that much value there in the end for those additional four that just went down. But, I mean, eight workers, 25 Zerklings is not bad whatsoever. I think the main thing... Ooh, and this just got scouted. The main thing that is going to be really good for Max Pex here is that he's already got that ultimate Protoss tech. He decides to go for the Mama ship. However, Raynor, with that Overseer, he must have just seen, yes, everything inside of the main base. Excellent scout right there by the Italian Zerg. He is going to commit to what seems to be a Hydraling Bane timing attack. So he's going into the plus one missile. He's got the ranged upgrade coming up right now for those Hydras as well. Speed is already finished. Keep in mind, though, that there are Blink Stalkers available. And Stalkers, yeah, not necessarily a terrible choice, but good control, yeah. You can certainly keep these units occupied. This is one of the best openers, by the way, that Raynor could have gambled into, right? So this is a bit of a coin flip right here for the Zerg. Skipping the Roach Warren and going straight Hydraling Bane. I would imagine that's pretty darn good right here for the Zerg player. Although maybe a quick Muta opener would have been even better, right? So he would have scouted it and then instead would have gone into Corruptors. But anyways, in this instance, yeah. If you're gonna go and commit to a ground-based Zerg army, blindly going into an anti-air unit is probably better than, for example, going Roach Ravager or Ling Bane. <sighs> Here comes the Overlords, though. Okay, Overlords are moving forward. Queens are pushed towards the front as well. I think this is a Queen March together with a whole lot of Creep Drop. There we go. That is something we rarely see at this level of the game. But obviously, it's very powerful. Okay, probes are running. Question is, can Max Pax hold on to this fourth base? And this reporter can only guess no. Sorry, I had I had to do a little bit of Donnie Vermillion, although there we go. The Mama ship does activate her cloaking. Uh, detection is coming up here regardless. Even if the Mama ship would have been slightly to the right, I don't think that Nexus would have been safe for much longer. Hydras managed to get the kill as well. And even though I do like what Max Max decided to go for here, I just don't think it is that good of a choice against one of the greatest players in the world. Sure, if Raynor would have neglected scouting, it would have been really good. Sure, if Raynor decided to go straight into a Roach Ravager play, it would have been really good. But ultimately, when your strategy involves taking a gamble, when your strategy relies on your opponent not scouting you, it's usually not a very good strategy. Now, I, I think this would have worked wonders if you go up against somebody who doesn't check you continuously, but the top-level European Zerks are very good at that consistent Overseer scouting. Now, of course, this is not game over yet right here for Max Pax, but this certainly puts him in a really bad position. If the third Nexus falls, I think he may as well just have to tap out. There's really not much you can do anymore at that point in the game. I really like the fact that he decided to bring the Overlords and the Queens like that, though, so rather than... Relying on dropping them or making a Nidus Worm, we just walked them over there and gave them some additional speed. So, what Max Pax does really well against Terran and also against Protoss, his two best matchups, is play that clean, clinical, precise game, right? So, he goes for at least similar looking build orders quite a bit, but he can figure out how to stay alive against practically everything that the opponent can throw at him. So in PvP, for example, he still does a lot of that one gate expanding that a lot of other Protoss players are quite allergic to. In PvT, I mean, when he goes for the Blink Stalker opener or whenever he goes for like the Phoenix opener, he can practically defend against everything. In Protoss versus Zerg, you don't really seem to have that option as the Protoss player. You have to be a little bit more aggressive. So, for example, the 
<laughs> That's the tricky part, right? So when you think about like StarCraft 2 players on like a macro to micro spectrum or like a defensive to aggressive spectrum, you have guys like, for example, Dark for Zerk, who are way on the aggressive side of things. And generally speaking, I mean, obviously he's good at macro too, but in general, he's w very, very aggressive, very, very micro focused and very cheeky, right? When it comes to playing Protoss, you have guys like, for example, Hero, that rely on Chaos and that are very good in that aggressive sense. I feel like Max Specs is on the exact opposite end of that spectrum. Max Specs likes being the defender these days, and I just don't really know if that playstyle is particularly well suited when it comes to playing top level Protoss versus Zerg. I kind of feel like you have to throw in, for example, a Nexus first, or at the very least try to catch your opponent off guard with your tech choice. If you go Stargate opener every single time into Blink Stalkers with plus one, sure you can win some games, especially if it's like a best of three or even a best of one, you can win against basically anyone. But when it comes to playing like, especially a tournament finals, which is at minimum a best of five, Usually, if it's a big tournament, it's a best of seven. We've even had some best of nines. That's something that Proto struggles with in general, but I, I'm not exactly sure if you can find a build order. And that's that's certainly what Max Rex is looking for, but I don't really know exactly if there is a build order out there that is good against quote unquote everything. Anyways, Max Rex is looking. He's trying to see if he can figure something out and. Once again, it is going to be that Stargate opener. In general though, and that is one of the reasons, right, why Protoss has underperformed in top tier tournaments over the last couple of years. In general, Protoss does need a little bit of that surprise factor where they suddenly show up with build orders and, you know, you haven't really seen them before, but they work, like I said, they work really well in a best of three. In a best of five, uh, yeah, tricking your opponent three times is gonna be tricky. Right, it's gonna be pretty much impossible, especially when you go up against, for example, a Serral. You're not. Yeah. You, the thing is, I don't really see who could win in a best of seven, Protoss versus Zerk versus, for example, Serral. I don't. I don't think there's anybody out there. Say, for example, it's a best of three, Hero versus Serral. I would probably give that like a seventy percent advantage, in favor of Serral. However, as soon as that goes to like a best of seven, I give it like a. 90% advantage for Serral. Yeah. And that, that I think, is one of the core issues that Protoss is running into in 2024. Anyways, the Adepts have committed towards the main base. Okay, two drones. Gets the Adepts out as well. Not bad at all. This was a relatively small group of Zerklings produced, though, here by Raynor. Okay. Ah. <laughs> I always love that. Whenever they, like, very quickly morph into Spore Crawler. It looks easier than it is, because you actually need to find the space. But obviously the space can't be too far away. Uh, Depths go into the main base. Queens, though, inside of the main, trying to be annoying. Don't lose the Oracle. Okay. Yeah, I think this is fine. Four drones and six Zerklings for two Adepts. Not bad whatsoever. Third Nexus, a little bit delayed, but nothing all too crazy. You have to, I guess, warp in one additional unit there to the very least stay alive. It is interesting, though, how, like, players that are strategically very different, like, for example, Max Specs, like, for example, Hero, how they are both incredibly successful in their own right. Yeah, it almost feels like they need to, like, uh, maybe they should merge into uh, an Archon, you know? We get, like, uh, what would be the Archon name of Max Specs and Hero? Max Row? Or Hair Packs? Something like that. Anyways, they need to, like, pick pieces of each other's strategies. In Hero's case, that mostly just means not using the old army hotkey. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, like, they kind of need to, like, look at each other's stuff a little bit more. Because this is, this is as normal as it gets, right? If you're a ladder hero, if you want to be a really good macro protos, if you want to reach high rankings in Grandmaster Leagues, I think, or in Grandmaster League, rather, I think following Max Pex's build orders is infinitely better than following Hero's build orders. Just because the man plays so quote unquote normal. But if you want to win tournaments, ah, playing ladder versus tournament is very different. Yeah. A lot of it is also that experience, though. That is also something that you can't really neglect here. 
Again, Mexpex doesn't play offline events, so maybe he just doesn't quite have that same mindset. He is going for quick charge, by the way. So this, I mean, this, I think this is for Mexpex considered to be really, really wild. He is going, rather than blink, he's going into charge. So I see this build quite a bit, so I don't think it's as crazy as... Uh, may maybe I should maybe I should hype this up a little bit more because this is for Max Max's sake. This is crazy, dude This is him taking the kitchen sink. He's ready to throw it at his opponent But maybe it's a bit of a mindset thing, right? So he's been saving up zealots So this is what I was actually basically suggesting save up zealots try to come up with a strategy error that your opponent doesn't quite Yeah, prepare for The only problem right now is that he does not have a war prism I like what he was doing last time though, where he decided to go for that mass expand and he skipped the gases at the third base. It was expanding all over the map. This is good. You know what? I take all of it back. I think what Maxpex is doing here is, yeah, this is exactly the type of stuff he should be doing. This is a weird attack. And I think in general, it's pretty flawed that Protoss has to do this. <laughs> you have to be a bit of a crazy dude, but Okay, good control right down the Zealots. A lot of very low HP Zealots. Look at that. Zealot Micro? Didn't think it could be done. <laughs> yeah, it kind of sucks that you are pretty much forced to do something weird like that. But I, yeah, I, I mean, uh, is the nature of the game right now. You have to adjust. Maybe in an upcoming balance patch it will not quite be the same. But Protals has always been, at least compared to Terran and Zerg, a little bit more gimmicky. Okay. Now, I liked it. Did it put him at an advantage? <laughs> this reporter can... Yeah, no, I actually think it's fine. I think this is a very playable spot right here. I'm not sure about the gases over at the third. I think I would have preferred seeing a faster fourth Nexus. But he is going into Immortal Archon here. So following it up... Yeah, in a very normal way. Here comes Rainer again with his relentless scouting. This really is something the European top-level Zerks are very good at. For some reason, they always see everything. Maybe that's also one of the problems that Protoss has, because Protoss is usually very blind. Eh, especially against Zerk, it's tricky, right? Because even if you would have more vision, Zerk can just, like, make a spire literally anywhere. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't really take... Doesn't really take much for Zork to do a sudden tech switch, which is maybe one of the strengths of their race as well, right? Anyways, there's the Hive coming up, all things considered. Very quick Hive. It started up right around the 8 minute mark. I'm assuming this is gonna be into Lurkers? Yep. Hydra's into Lurkers. And I'm sure this is gonna be accompanied with Vipers as well. Whereas in the meantime, on the other side of the map, we've got ourselves Blink, we've got ourselves the... Good old Storm upgrade, and... Plus two is going to finish up nice and early. Multi-layered pushes. I like this a lot. So these are pushes. Yeah, where the War Prism isn't part of the main army. And I kind of like it. It feels wrong to have a main fight over here at the front with just these units. But the Warpin in the main base, the Warpin over at the third, is putting in a ton of work. I sometimes wonder if we should see more like double Prism play. Because that really does... Very, very different approach, by the way, here from Max Pex, Compared to game number one of this series. He's inviting the Zerk onto his own creep. <laughs> Load of stasis wards being set up. That makes that attack relatively safe. Okay. Max Pex decides to go back home. Ah. It's tempting, though, because these stasis wards do last a very long time. Oh! Renner apparently did see it. You have a little bit of a shimmer, of course. Not easily seen. Okay. One aspect, and that is something that a lot of players and a lot of StarCraft criticists don't really like to talk about all too much. Uh, maybe I should hold that for just a moment. So we may just see a continued push. There's still no prism in this army, which really puts me on edge. I don't love the fact that there is no prism here in the mix for Max Fax. He's got that prism on purpose over at the third base, over in the main base. But it's it's so dangerous, right? Because these are all... Like, losing this army is game-ending. You cannot afford to lose any of that. 
Prism in the main base does scoot around. We're actually gonna fight the main bulk of the Zerg army? You know what? Max Max may have just found an opportunity. Yeah. Okay. The Observer at this point, is there still an Observer here? No, I don't see it here either, so I don't think it's taken anymore. We do have Revelation, so that really does help. You know what, the Immortal Archon is putting in a ton of work, but... None of the Lurkers are burrowed on the ground, they do deal a ton of damage. Zealots though in the main base still going to town, and now we have the Fleet Weaken with additional Star Gates. Okay, I think this is a lot nicer right here for Mr. Max Vex. Okay. Looks like the army has decided to go home. We're gonna produce a bunch of carriers. One final point that I wanna bring up when it comes to Protoss' performance at the absolute highest level. It could just be, right? And this is something that I find always kinda difficult to discuss, especially since I mostly play Zerk, because it makes me sound like a fanboy. Um, <laughs> the thing is, the players that win tournaments, there's, there's only a very small handful of them. And because it is such a small sample size, it could very well be that they are just simply slightly better than the top tier Protoss players. That the top guy, uh, the, the top ranking dudes at the, at the current time in StarCraft 2 just happen to choose to not play Protoss. Would Serral still win as many events if he played Protoss instead of Zerg? Would Maru still be very successful with Protoss instead of Terran? I know for quite a while on the European server, not that long ago, the highest ranked Protoss on the European Grandmaster League ladder was Clem. Like, Clem's MMR with Protoss was significantly higher than professional gamers that I cast on my channel all the time. <laughs> would Clem be more successful playing Protoss in tournaments? Probably not, because otherwise he would. But anyways, that is just another consideration, since the sample size is so small. Anyways, this is a great attack right here by Max Max. Ay ay ay. Max, uh, Max Max coming up with the mama ship here as well in just a moment. Hatchery here at the bottom of the map gets the knight. Let's go, Max Max. Let's go. We gotta get a shanting going. Maybe that's what we need. Some additional power. I like everything that Max Max has done in this game. Yeah. This is expertly played. And this is different, right? This is. Not quite the quote-unquote established standard. Yes, he did get Blink, but I don't think I've seen any Stalkers in this game. Well, no, he did get Blink, didn't he? Yeah, he did get Blink, because that's his, like, you know, that's his security blanket. That's his weighted blanket. He sleeps better when he's got Blink. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I think this is game over. Great stuff. Great stuff right here by Max Max. This is the kind of thing we need to be seeing more frequently. Of course, this is something that Zerk could have countered, but you can never see inside of the Twilight Council whether or not it is charge or blink researching. So it's always a bit of a coin flip. Alrighty, our final game for today, it takes place on the map Oceanborn. Let's see. I wonder when Zest is done with his military service. I have no idea if he's intending on coming back. But having Zest be part of the StarCraft community again would be amazing. So he started going to the military in the middle of 2022. I have no idea if he has any intention of ever coming back. But Zest is considered to be probably the most successful Protoss player of all time. I mean, there's a couple names that come up. Like, for example, Stats. SOS, obviously. is up there. There's, there's a bunch of players out there, but uh, he hasn't tweeted anything in years. Yeah, the Korean programmers, at least when it comes to, like, non-Korean social media, are not particularly great at giving us any updates. So, it does say on his Liquipedia page that his military service is ongoing, and that it started in... June of 2022. Now, in my mind, it depends on the branch of the military that you serve under, if I understand correctly, but for most of the top-tier guys that have to go to the military, they are back after about a year and a half or so. Sometimes like a year and maybe like eight to nine, maybe ten months. So there's a chance that Zest actually could be coming back in the near future. Either that or he's already done and he's decided to not come back, which obviously is whatever he likes to do. 
Um, I did mention this already in a previous video, and I don't think I really have to bring it up again, because you guys watch every single one of my videos, right? You guys have never skipped one, have you? I don't think so. Um, uh, no, jokes aside, I know that Rogue is going to be wrapping up his military, uh, his mandatory military service very soon. He started in October of 2022, so a little bit after Zest, and worked on the StarCraft Street has it that Rogue will be coming back within, like, the next month or two. No idea if that means that he's going to be playing tournaments again as well very soon, but, I mean, I'd be very hyped to check what Rogue is up to, because... Rogue really is one of the greatest players of all time. I feel like this game has become a uh, bit of a different one than I originally said. <laughs> like this video turned out to be a bit more of a uh, a balanced discussion than 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 uh, a game cast. But, anyways, I'm recording this on the Monday morning. All right, I've had all weekend to to think about this, and my entire weekend was one day alone. I spent most of it painting miniatures and watching a movie. I having coffee at my parents. That, that's basically all I did yesterday. Yeah. Oh, I really did tumble down the miniature painting rabbit hole. <laughs> I've been sharing some of the work on my Instagram in case you're interested. Uh, it's at Loco TV. Everywhere. You can feed my ego by becoming a follower of mine on Instagram. Do you want to feed my ego? Follow me on Instagram. There you go. Um, Oracle opener here once again by Maxipex. How much damage can we do? I'm gonna say three drones. I think he's gonna get three drones with the Oracles and the Adepts. Ooh, that was bait. So far, perfect. Flawless game by both players. I think he's gonna get three drones in total with the Adept Oracle harassment. Adepts have to come all the way back home before the third Nexus can be taken. Apparently we're gonna, yeah, complete the wall off here before we do anything else. And, well, perfect timing. There's that Nexus planted down. <laughs> A little bit of hold position micro right there by Raynor. Kickstarting his Zerklings. You'll have to see it. Alrighty. Here comes the Oracle. Oracle's got a friend. That one will be coming on the back of it. Drone has morphed itself into a spore crawler over at the natural expansion, the third base that Rainer made. Or maybe the second base he made, because he started with one. Excellent queen positioning over here, but apparently we're going to start target firing down one of them. Yeah, if there's no three queens together, you can actually kill one. I think that accounts for three drones, doesn't it? It's 150 minerals for a queen. Drones are 50 minerals each. I think I was right. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think I got it right. All right, so Twilight Council together with a fort once again. Will it be charged? Will it be blink? Will it be glaives? I don't like glaives. No, I think it should be charged. I actually kind of liked the charge in the previous game. Obviously, keep in mind, right, that in game number one of this series, Raynor decided to skip a Roach Warren. Imagine if you do a charge attack into somebody who's cutting a corner like that. Maybe that's the reason why we saw Maxpex doing it in game number two of the series, even though the Roach Warren there wasn't skipped. No, this is going to be uh, the normal style of playing it. Fair enough. Will we once again see a carrier transition? When the Twilight Council is about halfway through its upgrade. I don't think we should see it. But it is apparently something that Maxpex has been considering, right? So one thing you'll see quite a bit from Zerg players is an Overseer Scout as soon as the Lair finishes. So Lair at this point is finishing up. We do, by the way, have a straight Baneling Nest this time around. So I guess against the Zealot push, he would have been fine. Anyways, usually this would be the time for an Overseer Scout. So you make the Overseer, you scout around. I think in game number one, Maxpex may have put the... Additional Stargate and then also that uh, Fleet Beacon down after the first Overseer Scout. So the first Overseer Scout came in. I, I didn't actually check for this, but I think he put it down after the Overseer Scout and then Raynor decided to come back around again with another Overseer. So yeah, it was a mind game that he decided to play. Just a bit unsuccessful. This time around, it's a Twick, uh, <laughs> a Twick, <laughs> a Quick Templar Archives together with a Robo Facility. 
Mr. Probius, you gotta get back to mining. Good old Hydrolink Bane here once again for Raynor. Although he's skipping the Banelink speed upgrade. Keep in mind that Banelinks are not quite as strong as they once used to be. Especially against Protoss. They no longer, for example, one-shot probes with plus two melee, although this could be a big snipe. Yep. Forcing the council on that Nexus is actually very substantial. There's a lot of Stalkers waiting on the, yeah, the left side of the map, waiting in the wings, but... Not achieving all too much there yet. Nexus is gonna be replanted immediately. So we're gonna go up to eight gateways on three bases. With a fourth Nexus in, in waiting here. Okay. Overseer Scout in the main base sees everything. Here we go again. Is there enough? I think Hydrolink Bane is going to be an excellent choice against really any sort of gateway-based army. So this is plus one missile rather than plus one melee here for Raynor, which is a little interesting, I suppose. But this is a really mobile army, so Zealot runbys and whatnot, like what we saw in game number two, technically they shouldn't be as difficult to deal with. Especially since the Prism also can't dive quite as deep against a Hydra-based army as it can against a Roach-based army. Yeah, Max Max taking a more passive approach again. So that plays so well into Raynor's style though, because Raynor loves being out on a map at this stage in the game. Like, this is where Raynor gets so comfortable. 88 workers. When you get to that amount of drones, you can just produce. You don't have to really even think about it too much. Just make stuff. Make stuff that attacks. Tech up if you feel like it's the right choice. And just make a load of units. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think this is a very good approach right here from Mexi. I, I I imagine it works well against lower tier Zerks. But this is playing right into the arms of Raynor. Couple of roaches, or Hydras disguised as roaches. Killing a Nexus up there. Yeah, this is this is just a, a perfect early game right here by Raynor. He lost one queen, right? I think he lost literally one queen. I think that was the only thing he lost in the earlier stages of this match, and that is just not something you can really justify when you then follow it up with Stalkers and Blink. At this point, though, the only thing that's really lacking from Max Pax's style is being a slightly better tournament player specifically against Zerk. I think what he's looking for is a build order that works well against everybody, but that's not how you win events. Even if he now figures out how to consistently win against Raynor, which seems to be a bit of a hurdle in his play right now, if he one day does decide to go to offline tournaments, and we'll see how... You know, if that ever happens, I suppose. But if he ever if he ever does decide to commit to that, yeah, you're not gonna get as much practice against somebody like Serral, right? If you wanna consistently win, you're gonna have to be able to think on the fly. And I, I think that's the only thing that's currently really lacking in Max Pex's playstyle. Keep in mind that Max Pex is still very young. According to his Liquipedia, he's like, what, 19 years old right now? But for now, at least, it's Raynor, who is one bridge too far. Very well played, of course, here, by the Italian Zurich.